Welcome back, beloved Evergreen History of Motion Picture students, for the third and final installment of our Chaplain Saga. Um, I hope you guys have uh, learned a lot of things about Chaplin and about film history. Certainly no one more iconic than Chaplin. And we left off uh, coming into the, uh, the early 1940s, uh, right after the great dictator. Uh, I don't know that I mentioned this before, but I want to take a moment to do so, uh, because clearly before the rise of Hitler, Chaplin was wearing the what's called the toothbrush mustache. And so his likeness to Hitler is certainly intentional in this film. Uh, but a lot of people ask, well, was that just a common thing? And did one influence the other? Uh, kind of a, a yes to both questions. There, there are people, if you look back at older pictures of, of people, the toothbrush mustache was not invented by Chaplin nor Hitler. Um, and if you look at uh, even other comedy greats like uh, Oliver Hardy, part of the Laurel and Hardy duo, uh, there's a time where he uses the, he wears a, a toothbrush mustache. Um, so just something for that to keep in mind. Now, regarding the Hitler connection, there actually is something more immediate between him and Chaplin. Uh, Chaplin certainly had no love for Hitler. Um, and Hitler didn't really have much love for Chaplin. Uh, Chaplin had uh, liberal leftist views, um, very different from you know his fascist views. But the story is that... Hitler saw how enamored people were with Chaplin, and he wanted to be loved just like Chaplin. And the story is that he wore the toothbrush mustache uh, to so he could kind of look like Chaplin and be loved like Chaplin did. So, interesting story there. All right, we come out of The Great Dictator. And he's going to spend a lot more time in between films. Uh, we see with his uh, marriage to Una O'Neill, uh, there's kind of a newfound peace that he has uh, with her. Uh, she is uniquely devoted to his career, uh, peace in both their lives, uh, despite the big age difference. Um, there was a, a great connection and great under, uh, understanding with each other, a great love there. So he he wants more of the simple pleasures of life. Uh, not that he's not interested in filmmaking, but he's certainly not strapped for cash and he's not under any contract to keep producing films because uh, he has total creative control. So when he's darn well good and ready, uh, he will do that. And he does so in 1947 with a film called Monsieur Verdu. Now, Monsieur Verdu is a very different kind of Chaplin film. He's no longer playing the little tramp. Um, in fact, this is kind of a, a dark, a darker take. Uh, Monsieur Verdu is a, uh, a, a man who romances and murders widows uh, for their money. Now, the thing about Monsieur Verdu is it, uh, it definitely was a critical commentary on his time, uh, in his intention is to symbolize the mass murder, Landrew style mass murder. Uh, he is actually wanting that to be connected to the uh, wholesale killing license by war. Uh, he's making a, a again an anti-war kind of commentary in the same way he did with Great Dictator. Um, Although in Great Dictator, the anti-war message is about getting involved in a war in order to end the war. Uh, here, he's making a commentary about how war takes advantage of people and makes profit off of other people's sufferings. That's the, that's the idea that he's going forward with, uh, with Monsieur Verdu. Again, a darker, a darker kind of film. Um, it was, again, a pacifist kind of appeal. And 
we're going to see as he continues with his films, uh, probably much more um, uh, social commentary, definitely not subtle with, uh, with his films. So the next film I would say is the, the last seminal film of, of Chaplin. Um, it is, it is highly revered, um, but it is much more pathos than it is laughs. This is a very personal film for Chaplin, very much influenced by his, um, by his uh, work in the British music hall scene. Um, it's, it's about the, well, how can we put it? The, uh, the fickleness of the public, you know, they love you one day as a performer and then they not only can ignore you the next, but maybe be ready to crucify you. Um, and of course this is all pre internet, social media, Twitter age. Uh, and so this is probably a very, very personal and autobiographical film for uh, for Chaplin. Uh, it, it definitely is a reflection on his impaired reputation, uh, which we're about to get to. 52 is a seminal year for him, not only because of Limelight, um, but because of uh, a major uh, event in his personal life, which is going to you know, alter the rest of his personal life and career. Um, so Limelight, yes, is about this aging comic. Uh, he feels the need to, you know, get the limelight once more, uh, trying to appeal to the public and be true to himself. Uh, he takes under his wing this young dancer and trying to mold her into the performer, uh, successful performer that she wants to be and he thinks that she can be. Kind of a Svengali type of approach with that. If you're not sure what Svengali is, uh, you can look that up. But in the early 1950s, America was uh, dealing with some, some real internal conflict, to say the least. If you're familiar with the Cold War and communism and the Red Scare, it was a time in America where everybody was panicking about the spread of communism. And there was a philosophy going through America that communism is trying to in, encroach itself subtly and surreptitiously and secretly into American life. And there was a, a kind of a, what people have called a communist witch hunt uh, to look out for people who may be uh, stealthily trying to infuse communist ideas uh, to not necessarily spies, although that would be a part of it, but just to, to bring down American nationalism and capitalism from within. So no one was free from this. Uh, business owners and uh, politicians and certainly performers, entertainment performers were not above this. Uh, this certainly was part of the, uh, a part of the transition where Chaplin is going to have to actually leave the United States uh, and live the rest of his life in Europe. So here's the deal. Chaplin already has a problematic reputation. His personal life with the, the multiple marriages and other romances. Um, about this time, there is what's called a paternity suit. Basically, someone, a, a woman claiming that he is the father of her child. It actually ended up not being true, but the mud slinging was there. The mud had stuck. Problem number two his political views that were painted as anti-American. Um, the FBI already had, like I, I think I said before, they, they already had files on him going back to the 1920s. Um, so you have paternity suits, you've got scandalous relationships, you've got outspoken political views. And the third thing that really is harming his reputation is the fact that Chaplin never, ever became an American citizen. Uh, he always retained his British statehood, okay? Uh, he uh, And a lot of people were 
uh, were angered at that because he had made his money, had made his fortune in America, uh, but he wasn't willing to commit to that. And of course, there are tax issues that come with that. So this was a problem. And after Limelight is made, he goes to Europe with his family on a holiday, on vacation, on his cruise. He had already submitted the paperwork to get a re-entry permit, okay, because he's technically not a, a citizen of the United States. So you have to get a re-entry permit. Well, while he's gone, uh, there's a uh, kind of a public movement to have his re-entry permit denied. And um, at first, it seemed like this was going to work out. If you pause and you want to look at this article here, this is from September of 1952. Uh, in the bottom right, he talks about, I was given this in good faith. I accepted it in good faith. Um, what happens is he is denied. Uh, he is banned. Uh, he tries to answer those critics by talking about how his politics are not as subversive as everybody thinks. Um, but the damage is done, and he actually just makes the the decision, okay, I'm not coming back. So he self-exiles his family. He sets up camp and his home in Switzerland, and he lives there uh, for the rest of his life. He does continue to make, he, well, he makes two more films, one that he directs and stars in and writes and does the music. And the last one he directs and writes, uh, but only makes a, a cameo in. We'll briefly look at those. Uh, but this is that, that point in people's career, the 1950s. This was, uh, again, Chaplin was no saint, but next year when we get into the post-World War II era, um, this communist witch hunt and the Red Scare, or what we call the McCarthy era, because of Joseph McCarthy, uh, who was a senator, who was kind of spearheading all of these investigations, which were highly public, uh, not only in the newspapers, but in the new medium of television. Um, it, it, it's one of those periods in American history that a lot of people uh, see as just a dark regret, because people were panicking and people were uh, pointing fingers, and there are reputations and careers that are ruined um, for very, very poor, if no, if no evidence. So I'm all for national security. Don't get me wrong. I'm all for capitalism. I'm all for America, mom, and apple pie, even though I don't care for apple pie. Give me chocolate cream pie instead. But I'm all for America. But on the other hand, we're also about justice and fairness and due process of law and truth. That comes from the Bible, by the way. Truth. So, he's now in Europe. He makes two films. Uh, the first film made after the exile is called A King in New York. And it's very uneven. It's very much uh, a response to the McCarthy paranoia. Um, and a lot of people feel it's, it's much more about... Oh, how can I say... Uh, a bitterness, right? It's 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 much more the bitterness than um, genius. Uh, it's kind of a series of unfunny pokes at the American way of life. It's about a guy who kind of uh, rises to success in, in in television unexpectedly. And then. In the early to mid 60s, he releases a two volume My Autobiography, uh, kind of getting his own take on his life instead of others talking about him and uh, telling stories about his career. And then after 10 years, he releases his next and last film called The Countess from Hong Kong. Um, it was made in England with American money. Um, and unfortunately, more disappointing. People panned it as being uninspired and old-fashioned. The public uh, stayed away from it, even though it starred some very popular 
performers. It stars Marlon Brando and Sophia Loren, um, also Tippi Hedren. Chaplin makes, like I said, a, a walk-on. It's about a uh, an American in Hong Kong and this Russian countess who's trying to escape and you know tries to hide out in his apartment and you know there you go. Um, so yeah, I uh, for years with all of this, he felt the United States and the American public had basically said, "I don't want to know you anymore," and he said, "Okay." So I'm he had determined to never set foot on American soil again. But many years had passed. American uh, perspectives and um, people's reevaluation of him had changed. Uh, we, we had, by the, by the mid to late 60s, we had grown to look back at the McCarthy era with disdain, with regret, and for some time, he had been invited by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences to come and, uh, and accept an award. Um, and in 1972, he decides to finally come back uh, to accept this Lifetime Achievement Award for the, quote, incalculable effect he has had in making motion pictures the art form of the century. It is a heartfelt pilgrimage. You know, these are the people that he thought hated him, didn't want to see him again. Um, he had been growing his family, you know, having a lot more kids with Una, had his last kid when he was uh, 73 years old. Um, so he was just overcome with emotion. Uh, I'm going to post the link of his acceptance speech, which is mostly standing ovation. I mean, this is Charlie Chaplin, and he comes back after 20 years, and it's just a an amazing uh, reconciliation in this personal pilgrimage. Uh, people cheer, cheered him everywhere. Uh, there was a party thrown in his honor at the New York's Philharmonic Hall. What he said about it was, is that this is my renaissance. I'm being born again. And in a sense, he kind of was. There definitely was a, a, re, uh, a rediscovery of his, his old films by this time. Newer generations were enjoying his work. In 1975, the... The old street urchin that was dancing for pennies on the streets of London was knighted by Queen Elizabeth II. The picture on the right, there's Chaplin with Una. So now he is officially Sir Charles Chaplin. He does start work on a new project. Uh, got very close, but um, uh, a film called The Freak but uh, that was not uh, going to be finished because on Christmas Day of 1977, Sir Charles Chaplin uh, passed away. There, there's hardly a, a superlative in the whole English language about greatness that wasn't bestowed on Charlie Chaplin during his lifetime by fellow artists, by critics. George Bernard Shaw called him the only genius developed in motion pictures. Max Sennett, his old partner in the early days of his career, thought of him as the greatest artist who ever lived. And a lot of people criticize his later work. There seems to be kind of a resurgence of we need to pay more attention to his, his talkies um, as being uneven and flawed, perhaps. But his achievements as a director... Although he wasn't considered the greatest filmmaker, it was about the character. The admiration for Chaplin as the actor, the mimic, the, the eloquent comedian, um, that's universal, worldwide. His character emerged on the screen in the 1920s to put a, or the teens and the 20s, to put a 
a kick of humanity in the pants of the world, sometimes literally in his films. This is a world marching towards progress. He was and is an inspiration to artists, and he was an ambassador for an art form. The Little Tramp embodies the power of cinema. The power of cinema to to transcend barriers of language and culture. The power of cinema, its strength as a forum for social comment. And its magical way of turning fuzzy shapes of light into a well-defined personality that can make people laugh and cry. He brought a sophisticated intelligence and skill to slapstick comedy that forced those egghead intellectuals to recognize that art can also be popular. What a weird thought. Because there are a lot of people that think, oh, if something is commercially successful, if it's popular with the masses, it can't be artistic. That is a bunch of garbage, Mr. Hebert, you may quote. So it wasn't just about those popular things. I'm sorry, it wasn't only in those kind of self-consciously artistic products. In the early days of cinema, people tried to make it quote-unquote artistic to give it that respectability. No, you can watch Chaplin and see an art form being developed. The Little Tramp, he was combating a hostile and unrewarding world, and he did it with kind of a cheeky attitude and gallantry. And he brought the world a champion to the underprivileged millions who were the first of cinema's mass audiences. That's going to wrap it up for my thoughts on Chaplin, at least formally. Are there more thoughts on Chaplin? Uh, yeah. And this obviously is a focus on his art form. I am not going to make any excuses or, or say that I admire a lot of his personal choices. And where he is residing right now, um, I cannot judge. But this is the nature of history. This is the nature of, of art. And if we're going to talk about movie history, we're obviously going to spend some time with Chaplin. So on Friday, we're going to uh, look at a couple of Chaplin works uh, that I think really exemplify his style. And uh, I hope that you enjoy them and appreciate that. Um, if you have any questions, 